Hello again, everyone. So, this is the last part, so let's do it. So, the magazine says, You're saying that by monitoring someone's brain with an EEG, researchers have been able to isolate a certain frequency of activity that only correlates with conscious experiences. And Stuart says, There has to be a critical amount of gamma synchrony, but yes, and it can occur in different parts of the brain, kind of moving around. For example, if somebody is smelling a rose, they're going to have this gamma synchrony in the olfactory cortex, the part of the brain dealing with smell. If you're having visual consciousness, you're going to have gamma synchrony in the visual and frontal cortices, and so on. The gamma synchrony can be anywhere in the brain at any time, and it does correlate with consciousness. So, the idea, again, is that our consciousness is actually a sequence of discrete events, a sequence of quantum frames occurring at roughly 40 times per second. And, just like frames in a movie, our consciousness appears continuous because the frames are happening in rapid succession. Now, I should note that the frequency of conscious events can vary, and it could be that in heightened or altered states, we're having more conscious moments per second, which would mean that our perception of the outside world would be slower. For example, when there's a car accident and the car is spinning, people often report that time seems to slow down and the outside world appears to be moving half as fast as it usually does. This could be because their rate of gamma synchrony is changing from around 40 Hz to 80 Hz. And similarly, someone once asked Michael Jordan, when he was in his prime, how he was able to outperform the other team so well. And he said when he's playing well, it's like the other team is in slow motion. So maybe Michael Jordan was experiencing 60, 70 or 80 conscious moments per second, and the defence was only experiencing something like 40. We also see it in meditating monks. Buddhist texts describe flickerings of pure awareness that have actually been counted, something like six and a half million conscious moments in a day, which turns out to be in the gamma synchrony range. And a few years ago, the Dalai Lama sent some of his best meditators to a lab up in Wisconsin. They found that, whilst meditating, the monks had the highest gamma synchrony ever recorded. They were actually operating at about 80 to 100 hertz, whereas the experimental control subjects are at 40. And even at baseline, before they would sit down to meditate, the monks showed an unusually high rate of gamma synchrony. Years of meditating had changed their brains so that they were just normally in this higher frequency gamma range. That suggests they're having a richer and more intense conscious experience more frequently than the average person. And the magazine says, So if consciousness is arising as a certain frequency of quantum collapses in the brain, then your model could still be considered materialistic, right? Consciousness is still ultimately a byproduct of brain activity, just pushed down to the level of what you're calling quantum space-time. And Stuart says, hang on a second, material means matter. Matter derives from something more fundamental, which is quantum space-time geometry. So this goes way below the scale of matter. The basis of matter is immaterial. And the magazine says, can you elaborate? And Stuart says, basically, if you think of mind and matter and the relation between them, there are a number of different philosophies to choose from. First, you have dualism, where mind and matter don't relate. There's a brick wall between them. Next, you have ordinary materialism, the conventional view that says that matter creates mind. Then you have idealism and various mystical approaches, which say that mind creates matter. But, in my opinion, none of these work. They all have problems. So the final choice, I think, is what's called neutral monism, which has been put forth by such figures as Bertrand Russell, William James and Barack Spinoza in Western philosophy and various non-dual positions in Eastern philosophy. Neutral monism says that there's one common underlying entity that gives rise to, on the one hand, matter and on the other hand, mind. In our model, that underlying entity that gives rise to both matter and mind is quantum space-time geometry. In the Vedic traditions, you could call it Brahman, the underlying ground of being. So it's not materialistic. It goes below matter. We're talking 25 levels of magnitude smaller than an atom. There's no matter there. There's something else. I call it space-time geometry. The Hindus call it Brahman. You can call it whatever you like. Spirit, the cosmos, quantum gravity, whatever it is that gives rise to both mind and matter and underlies all of reality. So the magazine says, So you're saying that based on your model, reality could be seen as being fundamentally spiritual. And Stuart says, First of all, let me say that Roger does not relate his work to spirituality. 
but I personally have nothing to lose, so I figure why not? I recently wrote a blog about this topic after attending a conference on atheism. I called the post, Being the Skunk at an Atheist Convention, because I made quite a stink about spirituality there that didn't go over well. Basically what I said was that I don't follow any organised religion, and Richard Dawkins, Patricia Churchland and other atheists were there bashing religion pretty hard, but I said that based on what we know of quantum physics and consciousness, we have to take seriously the scientific possibility of spirituality. And in defining what I meant by spirituality, I mentioned three things. The first was an interconnection between living beings and the universe as a whole. And I said that this could be possible through the phenomenon of quantum entanglement, which refers to the ability of two particles to be intimately connected beyond the normal limitations of space and time. The second was some kind of divine guidance or cosmic wisdom influencing our choices, which could be due to platonic values embedded in fundamental space-time geometry. And finally, there was the possibility of consciousness persisting outside of the body or after death. About 10 years ago, there were these two studies about near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences that came out of Europe. Both involved several hundred patients who had cardiac arrests, and I think they found that around 17% of the patients had these near-death or out-of-body experiences. Then the BBC did a show called The Day I Died, in which they asked the researchers who did the studies if they could explain these experiences scientifically. And they replied, We have no idea. Why don't you ask Penrose and Hameroff, because they've got this weird quantum thing. Anyway, Roger wouldn't comment, but I said, well, under normal conditions, consciousness is happening at the level of space-time geometry in and around the microtubules in the brain. However, when the blood and oxygen stop flowing and quantum coherence in brain microtubules stop, then the quantum information that was there is not destroyed. It continues to exist at the Planck scale and it can leak out or dissipate but remain entangled as a certain pattern, at least temporarily. So if the patient is revived, the quantum pattern gets drawn back into the microtubules inside the brain and the patient reports having a near-death or out-of-body experience. If the patient actually dies, then it's conceivable that the quantum information can remain entangled in some sort of afterlife state. And perhaps the information can get pulled back into a new creature, a zygote or embryo, in which case you'd have something like reincarnation happening. Now, I'm not offering any proof that this happens. I'm just providing a plausibility argument. I'm saying that if it does happen, Here's how it could happen based on our model. It's scientifically plausible that if consciousness is a quantum effect occurring in space-time geometry, then any particular pattern of consciousness does not go away because quantum information does not go away. It just reorganises itself within space-time geometry. And the magazine says, let's see if I've got the gist of your theory straight. Essentially you're saying that at least some basic degree of consciousness is woven into the fabric of space-time itself and it's the coherent quantum activity amongst the microtubules in our brain that allows us to amplify or strengthen the basic universal consciousness that's already there. And Stuart says yes. Or simply to gain access to it, connect to it, become one with it. In our model, consciousness is a natural process occurring in space-time geometry at the Planck scale level. And the microtubules in the human brain have evolved into a specific configuration that allows this process to happen in a way that also involves cognition, computation and intelligence. Most people think that consciousness emerged over eons as a byproduct of random mutations and the inherent complexity of natural selection. But I look at it the other way around. I think a fundamental field of proto-conscious experience has been embedded all along since the Big Bang in the Planck scale, and that biology evolved and adapted in order to access it and to maximise the qualities and potentials implicit within it. Of course, putting consciousness at the most fundamental level of the universe also has big implications for enlightenment and spirituality. And I would say, to speculate a bit, that when anyone meditates or becomes enlightened, they're moving more deeply into that quantum realm. I think that when you meditate and attain nothingness, or what people call nothingness in their meditation, it isn't quite nothingness. I think it's actually space-time geometry and you're accessing the source of enlightened wisdom by tapping into that fundamental field, you move more deeply into the basic fabric of the universe and actually become more consciously a part of it.